Hello, my name is Tom. So, John Murphy, the proprietor of the iconic Land Ho. Uh, before we get into the history of the Land Ho and this building, the Cummings Block, um, I'd like to hear a little bit about your background, where you grew up, and uh, your connection to the Cape and when that began. Right. I grew up in North Adams, Massachusetts, and on completion of high school, as all young people at the time went in the military service stationed in Newport, Rhode Island. My draw to the Cape was my cousin, Frank Richards, who was a local attorney, uh, later town moderator, et cetera, et cetera. The flamboyant Frank Richards. Right. Great Frank. Anyway, I came up to visit Frank in 1959 and from Newport, and quickly recognized that Orleans area is something I really liked. Mm -hmm. Upon my completion of the Navy, I think I made two other trips up here to see Frank. And after my stint in service, Frank and four other men owned, they had bought the Southward Inn. And uh, they were opening up the Sinocid Inn. Frank invited me down to work for the summer. I was going to be going to school in the fall. And That's where the, the Southward Inn is where the Bank of America Bank Building is right, now. Right, right. Yeah. Great old building. Oh, super. Yeah. So I came down and Frank said, you know, we can make some pretty good money down here in the summer and, and uh, wanting to get away from the valley of North Adams. So I came down and, and worked four summers with Frank and them at the end while I was in school and got sand in my shoes. How old were you then? 21 uh -huh. when, I, when, I came, when I got out of the Navy. And uh, I went to school in Boston, worked summers down here. and. Uh, and one of my sojourns back to school, I ended up working in a place, Anthony's Pier 4 in Boston. The years before, I'd worked as a bartender in the Combat Zone, cook in Stella's in the North End, an Italian restaurant, various other places. But Pier 4 was kind of a premier spot at the time. It just opened. Owned by Anthony Atamus? Anthony Atamus, yeah. And uh, it was quite an experience. Very, very busy. Celebrities, I mean, you name it, it all happened at Pier 4. And Anthony had four sons and four restaurants. I had an offer to move out to Concord, Mass, and manage a private country club in the Shawtuck, which I did, picked up some experience, and one of the members was attached to Sheraton Hotel Corporation. He seemed impressed with what I had done, and I was invited to go to work with them, mm -hmm. which kind of rounded off full experience of the hotel restaurant business. Were you, uh, would you describe yourself as a back of the house guy with cooking and that, or were yeah, you more? Well, I did both. Uh, food and beverage directly with Sherrod. Uh, at Pier 4, I was in the front of the house, primarily. And of course, with Frank, I cooked, tended bar, whatever had to be done. Sheraton, my last stint was in Memphis, Tennessee, and I thoroughly enjoyed it transferred back to Boston. And working in Boston, I really, my memory would go back to the Cape, attending bar at the Southwood Inn, or Nosset Inn, as I know later. People talking about retiring in 10 years or 15 years, moving to the Cape, getting a house. And I said to myself one day, going in on the subway to work, why should I wait 25 or 30 years? Why don't I, why don't I go there now? Because Every vacation I had during that time, or weekend meetings in Boston, 
I squeeze time to come down here and just hang out. So I came down and there was a restaurant in East Ham for sale. Ira Johnson was the realtor. And I'd worked part time for Ira in the old land home back in the early 60s. So my conversation with Ivor, with Ivor was brief. He told me, don't buy the stupid place in East Ham, I'll sell you the land home. Things got together, we worked it out. Uh, I came as a partner, soon after bought him out, and uh, the rest, I guess, is history. And, uh, what year did you buy the, uh, 19, the old land home? 1969. 69. And, uh, it was four years, and then the block burned down. Uh, 73, December 30th, and the Johnson family rebuilt the block and divided it up between Cape Cod Photo, Land Ho, and the Gotland shop, Mop, and the Mop and shop and the Gotland horse. Oh. John, before we get on to the fire, which started a whole new period, which is really the modern Land Ho, um, tell me about some of the experiences in that initial Land Ho building, where I think the entrance was from 6A in here. Right. And when you first came in, um, it was an established tavern, but you didn't really serve much food. Was that what you Right. My, my ambition when I came down here was to get away from large restaurants, large hotels where you had hundreds of employees and scheduling difficulties. I wanted to live on the Cape, have a small business, go out and, and do what I've always wanted to do, paint and fish and whatever, and, and uh, enjoy the good life. Of course, in the restaurant business, there's no such thing as a good life. It's a, a lucrative life, but uh, you're, you're chained to the store. We opened, and you, you, under the law, you had to serve food of some sort. And they got by that law serving these infrared sandwiches. And coming from a background of some pretty intense places. I just didn't have the heart to throw a sandwich that was pre-made into a microwave oven, and, or at that time, an infrared oven, and, and heat them up. So I started selling hamburgers, hot dogs, cheeseburgers, fries, and Ellis's Market, which was across the street, was my distributor. I, I went over and I bought beef and so forth from them. And we served lunch from 12 to 2. And, uh, my first customers were Frank Richards, John Allman, Malcolm Hobbs, and countless others. Just and basically the local <coughs> group, but yeah. you did have some tourism uh, business in the summer, right? Yeah, you know, in the summer it was, it was a whole different ball game. Yeah. But we still maintained that schedule until 2 o'clock. I was the cook uh, during the week, three days, I was the bartender, cook, and waiter. But it quickly grew, and uh, I I hired a waitress, Sue Kelly, who had been around for years, and she, she was the lunch waitress Monday through Saturday. We didn't serve on Sunday. Many, many a night after 7 o'clock, I sat here behind the bar waiting for someone to come in, and many, many a night in the winter, I watched the tire tracks in the snow out on 6A just slowly fill in. I mean, no one went by, but I was determined I was going to stay open until 1 o'clock, a set of presidents, because the former management, some days they opened at 3, some days they opened at 5, some days they closed at 6, some days 9, and there was no conformity. So uh, You had to establish a regular schedule so people could schedule. rely on it. Yeah. What, what kept me alive the first winter when they were finishing the high school in East Ham, the contractors were 17 men who lived off Cape. Up north, north of Boston. And every day after work, they came to the Land Ho. We were really basically the only place around. And uh, with warm drinks and, and uh, relax a little bit. Hal's restaurant down the street, the diner, which we call Stan and Margaret's. That, uh, that's where the yard arm is now? It's where the yard arm is now. Every evening, uh, Monday through Thursday nights, I'd call Margaret and ask her what the menu is, and she'd recite meatloaf, mashed potatoes, peas, chocolate pudding, whatever. I'd relay that to the 17 men, and they all nod yes, because there's nothing else open. And at 7 o'clock, they left for Stan and Margaret's, and the rest of the night was mine. Hello. 
Yeah, alone. Uh, between six and seven, we had a lot of activity. We had the only cigarette machine in town after six o'clock. And I guess an excuse for the local builders and plumbers, et cetera, et cetera. After dinner, they'd have to run down and get a pack of cigarettes. Of course, they couldn't have a cold beer or a drink or whatever. And uh, we never established the fact that they were here for more than one drink because they would screw up the time with their wife and uh, she would catch on. You must have uh, handled a lot of phone calls from wives over the years. I could write a book about the phone calls. <laughs> you know, we set a lot of presidents back then. Uh, if the phone rings and it's for you, uh, if you don't want to speak, you have to leave because uh, I was... Don't want them marching in here with the kids. I, I've, been, I've been cornered many a time in different stores in town with an ang angry wife screaming that her husband spent his night at the land at home. And it was your fault. Yeah, it was. Of course. I, I tied him right there. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and also, Penny Beer Day on Christmas Eve, the beer companies used to supply some beer. It was uh, something that was established long before I got here. And the first year, it was a great party time for all the patrons. That first evening, I got home about 8 o'clock, Christmas Eve, snow was coming down heavily, Christmas music, fire in the fireplace. I thought it was wonderful to be here. And the phone rang. It was a woman whose husband had been here Penny Beer Day. And she screamed at me. I couldn't hear for two days uh, that he got home and fell asleep on the couch and couldn't put the toys together that I should go up and do it. Needless to say, that was the last Penny Beer Day. You know, so the, the tradition was over. So you bought you bought the hoe in what year again? In 69. In 69. Okay. And ran it at that old building, right. and then um, the fire was when again? December 30th, 73. Of 73. That was a, right. a big happening in the right. town of Orleans. Right. You know, my, my first interesting remembrance of that first summer on Cape Cod was in May. They had either a special town meeting or the town meeting. I, I don't remember exactly, but Frank Richards was the moderator cousin for him. And he called me about five minutes to seven. And he said, Murph, we need, we need to get a quorum at the elementary school. Close up the bar and get everybody to come with you to the school. I said, Frank, I, said, I can't close. I said, you know, I need a plan. I'm here every night until one o'clock. And the only two people here are Stanley and Wilbur, a couple of our old regular customers. Well, what was Wilbur's last name? Wilbur Chase. That's what I thought. Stanley, Chase. Stanley Eldridge. Stanley Eldridge, okay. So, uh, a few minutes after I hung up the phone, Joe McWilliams, who was a former employee of the Land Hall before me, came in and, uh, as I say, it was just Stanley Wilbur and myself. So I asked Joe if he'd watch the bar for me for 45 minutes or so while I go to the town meeting. And I grabbed Stanley and Wilbur took them with me. And they were confused, they didn't know where we were going. And I said, it's gonna be a fun time. On our way to the elementary school, we were passed by several volunteer fire department people in their pickup trucks with lights flashing. And then the Orleans fire truck that was parked in the old annex building over here, they went flying by me. Well, I get to the elementary school, and lights are flashing, and we pull in. Frank motions me to hurry up, hurry up. And Don Walsh, who was the uh, police officer that night at the town meeting, he had a clicker and he and Frank were counting the people. So we got inside the building and they slammed the door shut. They had a quorum. Frank told Don, he said, just don't let anybody out. Well, the meeting starts and one of the volunteer firemen made himself known and he said, Mr. Moderator, uh, we live in East Ham. He said, that's all right, it's only going to take a couple of minutes, we'll be finished. Frank had called in a fire alarm. I mean, today you'd go to jail for that. Back then, it raised a lot of people. So that fire, that was uh, one of the big happenings historically in the town of Orleans. Um, what happened? The, the coming block was completely destroyed, correct? Well, the uh, December 30th, I was on my way down. Uh, traditionally, I'd always come at 6 o'clock if I was not here during the day, for what we call the changing of the guard of the bar, the day shift to the night shift. 
and I'd stopped to visit Ron and Jane Adams on Monument Road. And I'd only been there a few minutes when the phone rang. Jane said it was for me. And I picked up the phone, it was the, the dispatcher from the fire department police station. I said, John, there seems to be a fire at the land ho. That's all she said. I hung up the phone and went out the door. Got in my car as I turned, backed up and turned. In the center of town was just a glow in the sky. Wow. And it was a light rainstorm. So I drove down here quickly and, and uh, it was a pretty good fire going. The uh, whole fire department showed up, plus about two or three thousand people, I think. It, it looked to be that way. And Harwood sent over their big ladder truck. They had a truck to get high in it. They, it, they pumped over two million gallons of water on the building. Everything was leveled with the exception of the land code. And uh, they kind of joked that it was so soaked with beer over the years that it wouldn't burn. But that was the one part they had to tear down. Everything else was pretty much leveled. The fire whistle that called all, all the uh, fire department stayed up on the roof for about another hour. And then it sounded like a whistle bomb and it was dropping out of the basement. That in itself caused a little chaos at the Nauset workshop that had taken over the town annex building for the building projects. And the students there would always have their lunch at 12 noon. And that first day, back to the classes over there after the fire, they tried to get the kids to stop working for lunch. And they said, well, Mr. Murphy's whistle hasn't blown yet. And it was, and they, they weren't gonna stop until they heard that whistle. So it was a little bit of a dilemma. So the Cummings block was no more. Right. Completely leveled. Uh, my father-in-law at the time, uh, Dell Johnson Jr., owned the property. He bought it from um, he brought bought it from his father, Dell Johnson Sr. Right. And uh, he immediately began the rebuilding process, and that's the building that we see today. Right. How long did that process take? The fire was late December, so yeah, it reopened for the following summer. It took about three, a little over three months to build the building, the exterior get everything finished. The component company they had in their construction business built all the panels, et cetera, et cetera. Cape built homes. Cape built homes, yeah. right. Well, and uh, over on Great Western Road and, and, uh, and Harwich. The uh, interior took, oh, maybe another month to finish. And I had Bob Berger, a local uh, craftsman, cabinet maker, et cetera, et cetera. Bob did the interior for him. And uh, there was a lot of excitement because everyone missed the land ho. And uh, every day near the end of our remodeling, the staff would come in to work, paint, stain, clean, and they'd always bring their working uniform with them because we didn't know exactly what day it would be. Mm -hmm. So one day we, we uh, announced this, today's the day we unlocked the door, and for the next two days it was just party time. I mean, I think it was the third day before we finally sold a sandwich. Really? Yeah. yeah. My recollection is that you had a like a grand opening, and and it was a it was lunch. And yeah. I recall coming here for that for that lunch that day, and it yeah, seemed that was the first day you were open. Yeah, but we didn't serve any food. Nobody, oh. nobody. It, it, we just. We didn't announce we were opening, we just opened the doors. Oh. And uh, the word spread quickly. I mean, it took about an hour before the place was full. When was that that you opened? What date was, it was that? In, it was sometime in May of 74. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, Lanho stories through the years, and so a lot of characters that came in. But before we get in, I want to just go back to the old hole. I think that's when it happened. The famous story of the guy that rode the horse. You rode the horse right. into the land hall? Yeah. What was that? Well, his name was Harris Garber, and he lived down in Skaken. And he, where he lived, there's, there were horses there. And in 1966, when it happened, uh, it was that 
famous Christmas Penny Beer Day. <laughs> now, I was, at that time, I was in Tennessee working for Sheridan. And I went in the office, I think it was two days after Christmas, and our sales manager at the hotel hollered over to me and he said, have you ever heard of a place called the Land Ho? And I said, of course I have. It's in Orleans on the Cape where I spent many years. He said, look at this article. Well, the caption on the Memphis Press Seminar front page was an AP story. So this horse walks up to the bar and it tells the story of a fellow riding his horse into the land ho. And they had it in the bar. It was a shed bar off the side of the building, fairly small. And they were giving the horse beer out of these big schooner mugs they had. And the party got a little raucous, and they were afraid the horse was going to kick the gas stove in the corner. Someone called the police. The police showed up, and it was kind of out of control. They started spraying mace, and of course, the customers are falling off the bar stools, and the horse is just jumping around. So they got the horse out, the patrons out, and they closed the place down. They were finally they were ordered a short time later by the board of health to tear off that shed building, the bar, and they moved the bar back into the main section. My run-in with Harris Garber was the first night that I owned the Land Ho, or was a partner, I should say, at the beginning. About seven o'clock, this fellow comes in, tall, good-looking man, stood at the end of the bar with a smile on his face. I walked down and I kind of knew who it was. He ordered a CC in water. And he said, you're the new owner. I said, that's right. He said, geez, I think I might go home and get my horse. <laughs> I said, well, you can go home and get your horse and bring him up. I said, the horse puts one hook inside the door. Bang. <laughs> and I shoot him. He said, you shoot my horse and I'll sue you. And I said, well, I didn't tell you where the second shot was going. You know, John, um, let's go back to the, the history of this location. I don't think many people realize the important historical significance of the Cummings Block, which is what the uh, Landho occupies. And um, it was owned by H.K. Cummins, who um, was um, had a lot of historical uh, meaning to, the, to our town. He's well known, most of all, of these days with his uh, the photography that he did, recording the town of Orleans and what it looked like in uh, the late 1800s and um, into the early 1900s. But this building itself housed uh, that, the original pants factory. And his fa I think H.K. Cummins' his father owned this building, and then it was left to him. And then it went to old Del Johnson, and then Del Johnson Jr. Um, but there was a pants factory here. H.K. Uh, Cummins started the very first phone company in the town of Orleans, and that was here in this building. And I think uh, there's been a tavern at this site since the 1920s, right? Right. The, uh, the first restaurant that I knew that had a name bearing this place for years is this is Pearson, who had married one of the Mayos, and she moved down from Quincy. And they opened a restaurant called the Ship Ahoy Restaurant. And that was in around, I think, 1930-31. And that name stayed here until 1959, when uh, there was a change of ownership. Oh, Ray Peralt from Brewster had owned it for quite a period during the ship Ahoy Day. And he sold to uh, the Johnsons, uh, Pat Poor from who owned later the Lobster Pool in East Ham in 1959, and they named it the Land Ho. In 1966, after the horse incident, the town forcing them to take off the side of the building, they brought in another partner, Jim King. And Mr. King brought in some novelty items, some old signs that we still have here, the Bell of the West and New Jersey Shore. And they changed the name to the Quarterboard Lounge. Back in those days, there, there were several places in Orleans in the early 60s 
the Capitol Nut House had the gay 90s bar. The Orleans Inn always had entertainment downstairs. We Quasit was a good place to go. Packet Landing in East Orleans for pizza. Which is now the uh, Barley Neck Inn. What's now Barley Neck Inn or Joe's uh, Bar and Grill. And then the Southward Inn. Yeah, the Southward Inn. That's where I work. The uh, Fisherman's Bar is a very popular place. And, uh, when did the tradition of uh, local characters, uh, patrons, businesses, these signs hanging from the ceiling, how did that begin? Did it start right away when you, when you first opened the new hall? It wasn't until, I think, 75, maybe early or late 74, that a, a man by the name of Buddy Mikesley used to come in every day for lunch. And Bud brought his brother-in-law, Stu Hockenberry, and uh, Bill Arbuckle, who, and Walter Hyde, who owned Hyde Brewster, used to come. These people came every day. And they took a large table in the back. In the case of Mr. Mikesell, every single day. Oh yeah, every day, plus three nights a week, sometimes four. And this was his home. His son, Hank, made a sign that's up in the corner. It's local color. And it has the logos of six or seven different places. Uh, one being Ted Bell, who worked for the local radio station. He was a disc jockey. It was a microphone. Uh, Ty Brewster was a rooster. And so on. Buddy worked for Bethlehem Steel. He was 90, 97. I think he was like 37 years he came in here. And, wow. Uh, Every day, and in fact, in later years, if it was bad weather, he'd call and I'd get out and pick him up. He and Stu and the others in my four-wheel drive, we called it dial a lunch. That's a nice service to provide for well, the yeah, elderly. Well, it, it meant a lot to him. Was, yeah. This was his life. I mean, yeah. he, he couldn't think of sitting at home. Yeah. And I'd bring him up, and the only problem was at 2 o'clock, they all wanted to go home, and I'm still running around, you know, busy. But we took care of him. You know what's interesting is that um, I've always considered the Lan Ho to be really like the heart and soul of the town of Orleans. It's located right in the center. There's been a tavern here since I think back into the 1920s. And what's very interesting from a restaurant business perspective, and you'll agree with this, that a restaurant as a business doesn't normally get elderly, businessmen at lunch, uh, young people, fishermen coming in after a day's work, and the, and the workers from around town coming in after work. And then at night you have, you have groups, you have uh, entertainment here, and then you have the young people. Right. It's very rare that a restaurant will attract old and young businessmen and fishermen, and you've got everybody. It's a complete mix. And I think, uh, again, what's interesting about the Land Ho it reminds me more of the pubs in Ireland. Yeah. The pubs in, the Ir in Ireland have a tradition where they're not so much bar rooms as it's where people gather, right. where people meet. And in Ireland, they don't go, you don't go to each other's homes, you meet at right. the pub, or in this case, at the home. Yeah, it's, uh, I've always said that I would love to have had 1% of all the business transactions were, were negotiated here, whether legal or illegal. But, uh, it, it, and a lot of court cases were settled here. You know, the lawyers would come up and discuss sort of lunch. A lot of uh, marriages began here. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of people. A lot of here. divorces began a here. A lot of came here. I mean, you know, we were an all-service producer. I mean, we, we covered every base. But as far as the people, I, I remember going back to sometime in the early 74s. It was a very busy night. And as you say, we had a real mix of people. And I looked over and there's a fellow, Frank McGee, who was a news correspondent. I think he, I think he was with NBC. And at that time, were very well known to the television viewing audience. And I looked over and table 24, he was sitting there with two elderly people and a couple of younger people. And my first gut thought was, oh my God, this guy's going to be so offended because We've reached that line in the day where it's now the young crowd takes over. Mm -hmm. The jukebox was up many decimals. And I walked over almost embarrassed and, and uh, I said, is everything okay? And he said, God, this is the greatest place I've ever been in. This is wonderful, wonderful. I really enjoyed it. You know, I saw more of it. It's, uh, 
it's, it's been a fun place. It's, uh, you know, I mean, you can see Grandma sitting there and next to her a couple of fishermen. And, uh, yeah, that's what's so really unique about it. Um, and even through the years, you know, there have been a few celebrities that have stopped by. I think you oh, mentioned... Yeah. Uh, it was always fun because people would recognize these people but never want to say anything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and they li they liked it because they got recognition without being hassled. You know, it's, it was part of our thing. And the actor, um, he, he's actually a resident of Orleans, is Kevin McCarthy. Not so many people know him now because he's quite elderly, but he was a regular here. Oh yeah, yeah. Kevin was here this past uh, fall. They spent the summer up in Gossip Heights. Mm -hmm. And I've known Kevin for about 40 years. Tip O'Neill was uh, Tip from here from time to time? Oh yeah. When, when Tip retired, he spent more time here. But, before that, and I met Tip when I worked at Pier 4 in Boston. Our, our local artist, Bob Vickery, did the official portrait that's hanging in the uh, in the Senate. Right. Oh, oh yeah, we can't forget our old buddy Sumner Robinson. What was your nickname for him? Morris. Morris. We had our own Rat Pack here. Some true. Of his cronies. And, uh, true. But Sumner was, he was a genuine guy. I mean, uh, very creative, very outgoing. I, I had several good relationships with Sumner in business. Mm. And, uh, he was very ta talented in the financial world. Yes, he, his, his mind was a computer. Yeah. One of the first computers I had ever seen work. Gaston used to come in? Oh yeah, Gaston Orjo. Uh, Gaston was a great guy. I mean, he was at an era when, like the town hall, Gaston, Tommy Nick, there was a good group of people. Mm. And to read anything about Orleans in the Standard Times of that day, the only thing you could ever find was the obituary column and ads for different businesses. There was never really anything controversial. Occasionally, Gaston might do something like fill in a marsh or someplace, but the, other than that, it was the town was great. You know, it just uh, existed and. and uh, the town hall, all the departments did their own, their own thing, and they, mm -hmm. they, they really they pulled it through. We had thoughts on our 40th anniversary of a reunion party, but I don't think it's a place big enough to have it. With the thousands of waitresses right. and bartenders, bartenders and, and uh, there was a tradition here for a number of years, both on Fourth of July but particularly Labor Day, when we had, I say we. A lot of us would come here at the end of the season party, and uh, it got a little wild to the point where I think the land hoe used to close on Labor Day, maybe at three in the afternoon, and, and sweep everybody out, and then no. reopen around seven. But no, those no, parties we, were unbelievable. No, we used, that was Fourth of July. We do something like that on Labor Day. We opened at eight in the morning, since we have an eight o'clock license. Oh, and last call was given at eleven forty-five in the morning. And during that four-hour span, everybody who was here that summer came in for that last hurrah. Mm -hmm. and we used to take the tables and chairs out, <laughs> and they'd dance. And, of course, they'd be having drinks and cigar. And at 11.45, Orleans, East Ham, and Brewster would send a cruiser to direct traffic so that all the cars leaving the center of town would get out safely and so forth. I think we stopped doing that in 77. I mean, the society was changing. But uh, after, after we'd leave, after they'd leave on, on those days, we'd literally take a hose to wash out the inside of the building. <laughs> I mean, uh, it was a good time, that last party, and most of the kids were going back to colleges and, or off for the Cape for the winters, skiing or whatever. But there, there are a lot of, a lot of fun memories in those days. Yeah, those parties with uh, the Fourth of July parties or the uh, Labor Day. I don't think you were here the day uh, that my brother and uh, some of the waitresses were doing the can can on top of your bar. Oh there. no, I was here. Oh, you were. Yeah. You, uh, you allowed that behavior, John? Well, <laughs> you couldn't a, stop it. Uh, no, uh, you couldn't. I mean, everyone was in a, in the mood. Uh, <laughs> I think the following year, they were preceded by the Orleans American Legion women doing the can-can, the match the, the year before, the tradition your brother started. You know, there's a, um, 
I don't know if you've ever seen this ad. There's an ad for a, a luxury watch, I forget the brand name, in magazines that's been running a couple of years. And the basic premise of the ad is uh, that you don't actually own this luxury watch, you're a caretaker for it, and then you pass it along to the next generation. And that's starting to happen here at the Ho, where um, it's gotten so um, well known and it's such an icon in the town that uh, John Murphy is really the caretaker and then you pass it along and I think you've begun the process. I don't know how much longer you plan to be in the business, but uh, your children have, uh, your three sons have taken over um, some of the management here and then your new land ho in Harwich. Um, how much longer do you plan to, to, to stay in the business, John? I've never thought about getting out of it. Mm -hmm. I've thought of cutting down a bit. John Jr. is the manager here, and he does a great job. Great personality. Uh, yeah, people love him. Yeah. Yep. And the boys, you know, they brought in another view of the business. In other words, same old, same old, as I always said. You know, you don't want to change something. But they've seen, they've made very subtle changes in different things that complement the business. Yeah, the food's, the food's great now, right? <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I, I still enjoy the people. I, I like the community. Mm. I might be a pain to them on occasion if I see something that I, I don't like. But uh, I've never thought about retiring or quitting. As you know, I started painting quite a bit a few years ago, and, uh, exhibited in Paris, et cetera, et cetera. And I really, I really want to do more of that, but still be able to, to Patty Bullock, now Patty Bonanno, and your husband's Charlie, well-known uh, shell fisherman and, and uh, rock musician, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, when did you start working at the Land Home? Because everybody knows you. Okay, I started in September of 1983. So that would be my math. 27 years 27, yes. this coming September. Yes. Wow. Never expect to be here that long. But it's Do you remember the day you came in and applied for a job? Who did you talk to? Did you talk to John? I talked to Kathleen. Kathleen Berger. Oh, really? Yes. I know Kathleen. And actually, there was no openings at that point. But she saw me in here drinking on a Friday night, and she approached me and said, you still want the job. So that's how I got the job. Oh. Interesting. Um, so, uh, your husband Charlie, 
I think you told me that uh, you met him at the Land Hope. We actually met through the Land Hope, was through mutual friends. Um, I used to wait on him, not knowing who he was, and he kind of asked about me, and we got kind of put together by mutual friends. Uh -huh. So it's another Land Hope romance. Another Land Hope romance <laughs> among the thousands. <laughs> among the thousands, yes. And there's been Land Hope divorces. Fortunately, oh, yes. you haven't been there, but. I know, the Land Ho is really something. A lot has happened in the history of Orleans here over yes. the years. What was it like in 1983 that would be different from today? What, it's much busier now, right? It's busier in the food department. In 83, it was more a bar, I would say. Uh -huh. It was more a drinking establishment. Uh -huh. so, now, the drinking laws have changed, and people are more conscious about drinking and driving, and that's a big change yeah. from 1980. Yeah, that's true. Back then we used to serve our drinks in mugs. Like everyone would have white Russians in mugs and cake cotters in mugs. And, wow. Yeah. When I was talking with uh, John Murphy earlier, I mentioned those famous um, like end of season parties on Labor Day yes. and those parties on 4th of July. Yep. Were you a part of any of that? I was here for a Labor Day party when they took all the tables out. Yeah. It was all dancing and drinking and partying. There yeah. Very few, very few food was served. Yeah. It was more a big celebration. I think I'm the longest running employee that this restaurant has ever had, besides John, of course. Yeah. Wow. So if he's 40 years in business, I've been here for close to half of that. Yeah. You're the head waitress here now, right? You've finally risen to the top? I have, yes. <laughs> so what do you do? You, you hire and I don't really schedule? hire. I do do the schedule when OJ's in Costa Rica to help yeah. her out. And uh, I'm here to answer questions and help out with the girls if there's a problem. Do you do scheduling? I do, do the scheduling, yeah. yes. So have, there must have been some changes since 1983 till 2010. Well, what's say, the, how is the Land Ho different? I would say there's been quite a few. Um, Land Ho is more of a restaurant now as opposed to a bar yeah. back in 83. Yeah. Um, it's more of a family affair than the local carpenters and fishermen and uh, single hangout that it was back then. Um, there's entertainment now at some night. There is entertainment, which we, I don't believe we had entertainment back in 83. Yeah. In, yeah the the entertainment was all with the customers. Yes. <laughs> the local <laughs> color, as it's yeah. called. Speaking of local color, there's a round table down by the jukebox. Yes. And anytime I come in here, say from 5 o'clock on, there always seems to be uh, a cast of local characters there. That tradition, how long has that been going on? Ever since I started working here, they really? used to come in. Uh, just, and almost the same group of people. Some have passed away since then, but uh, it's the same carpenters and fishermen and... Uh, uh, a policeman, I see a policeman there occasionally. Off-duty, of course. And, uh, newspaper journalists. Uh, uh -huh. Real estate agents. <laughs> yes. But they're a good group of guys. And girls, too. So are there any memorable characters from that particular group that um, that you have any memories of? I would say there's quite a few. Um, one of the most memorable that sticks out is Bruce McFarlane, yeah. who used to own McSquids, which is now off the hook, um, which is a bait and tackle store, yeah. uh, guns, things like that. Bruce was a really, really good guy. Um, he could be curmudgeon, I would say. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he was set that's in a his polite, ways. That's a polite term for pain of the neck. <laughs> <laughs> no, I knew Bruce. So he was a good guy. Yes. Very set in his ways, very outspoken, very sweet, too. Do you have any stories about Bruce? Um, I would say one of the better ones was when he ended up boycotting us for a couple of months. Oh, and really? <laughs> And the reason why he did that is one of our new hirees, uh, summer hostess, didn't really know about the round table and who they were and uh -huh. how important they were. And uh, it was a busy summer 
day or night, I would say night more. Um, he was one of the last round table people that, that was at the round table sitting there and she kind of needed to put a family there and she kind of asked him to leave and he was not too happy about that. <laughs> so yes, he did get up and leave and yes, he did stay away for two months. <laughs> well, so when he leaves, he leaves for a while. Yes. <laughs> And I think somebody finally, John most likely, called him up and said, you know, please, you're welcome back. You can have that table whenever you want it for yeah. how long as you want it. Yeah. You know, what's interesting. There's a hotel in New York City called the Algonquin. And it was very famous for their the same expression. They had the round table. And there were a group of writers and film people there that would do the same thing. They'd meet every night, and sometimes there'd be various different characters there, but that went on for years and years and years. So you refer to that as the round table? That, they are the round table. Oh, wow. yes. interesting. Um, there are a couple characters in the Lanho Pass that uh, you knew pretty, you got to know pretty well. Wilbur, uh, was there a Wilbur? No. Uh, there was a buddy, an older gentleman. Um, Used to, he worked for Bethlehem Steel for a long, long time, and he was in, he was probably in his late 80s when he finally passed away. But he came in here every day for lunch. He drove his car from East Orleans, came here on snowy days when he couldn't get here. John would actually go and pick him up. But they were the lunch round table. He oh. used to go in for lunch with the same cast of characters. What was his last name? Buddy Michelson. Oh, Michelson. Yes. Yes. Used to sit over there. Yeah, I remember that. And he'd be here every day for years. And he passed away, but he, he came in and hit, so he was about 90 years old. Didn't oh, yes, he? yes. Yeah. I think I was here for his 80th birthday party, and they had a big celebration for him. And uh, the highlight for him was they brought him in a blow up doll. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> hmm. But he would come in for Did his the, one or two. Did the blow-up doll join the table? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it sat on Buddy's lap. <laughs> oh, nice. Gives new meaning to a lap dance. <laughs> but Buddy was, um, he's, his local color sign was the first sign in this whole restaurant. Oh. So that's how the whole sign thing came about. Oh, really? Because I think his son maybe had that made for him. and gave it to Buddy, and Buddy had it put up here. Oh, interesting. So in 1983, when you started here, there weren't all this, the tradition of there all these signs? There was some, but not as many. Yeah. Patty, you know what's really unique about the Land Ho is the fact that uh, I don't know of any other restaurant that gets a little bit of everyone here. Old people mixing with young people, it's a date scene at night, it's a... Uh, Ladies lunch place, it's a businessman's lunch, it's fishermen, carpenters. Uh, Attorneys, everyone's mixing with each other. Yeah. Know, so. And kids, there's always kids around here too, you know, kids. on weekends. Uh, families that have been coming here for years. Um, I've watched little children grow up and now they're 21 years old, 22 years old, and they still come back here and uh, they love it here. Yeah. This is an institution. People that come to Cape Cod come to the Land Hope because it is such an institution. It's true. Have you? Um, have there been any famous people that have come in here oh, that you? There's been so many famous people. Uh, actually, one day a bunch of the waitresses sat down and we tried to make a list of all the people that have been in here, and it oh, was yeah. like 50 people. But uh, 50 people that would probably at least be recognized. 50, if not more. Yeah. Yes. And they do appreciate it that we don't make a fuss around here. We yeah. wait on them just as if they were somebody, you know, just the boy next door, or the guy, girl next door. You never ask for an autograph? I never have, no. Oh, good. <laughs> I don't like that autograph. <laughs> so let's see, who are the people? I think uh, uh, John Murphy mentioned Tip O'Neill used to come in here. Tip O'Neill used to come in. Uh, back in the early 80s, um, I waited on him quite a bit. He used to come in with his golf ponies mm -hmm. after Eastwood Hall. Uh, he was very, uh, very polite. Go up to him and say, "Can I get you something to drink?" And he would go, 
young lady, that's a very good idea. <laughs> and he would have his scotch or his bourbon or whatever I believe he drank back then. Uh, that's pretty funny. Um, I've met uh, Pip a couple of times and he's an amazing people person. I mean, yes. the people just gravitate toward him. He's a real um, handshaking uh, politician, really. Yes. So who, who, um, who drank scotch? Huh? I believe scotch, scotch or bourbon. I forget which one. And beer occasionally? John, I, thought he, John thought he drank beer. He might have, but I just remember the scotch, the, the something on the rock, something hard liquor on the rocks. Okay. Um, who else? Um, I would say some of the bigger ones, if you could say bigger ones, was Paul Newman, uh -huh. uh, Donald Sutherland was in here, uh, George Siegel, uh, Kevin McCarthy, who yeah. still comes in. He, does he live in Orleans? He's, I believe he lives in East Orleans. Yeah. His niece used to work here for one summer. Oh. Uh, and John Kennedy Jr.? John Kennedy Jr. Used to come in when he was diving with the Widow crew. Uh huh. Um, so that always caused a stir because I think they even had to have the Secret Service like in the background around here because of that. Um, Interesting. Did you ever wait on him? I never waited on him, but a couple of the other girls have, and they were all gaga over him. Yeah, he was quite a handsome guy. Uh, Tony Soprano was in, uh, in the summertime, in the back bar, and uh, I shouldn't say Tony Soprano, I should say James Gandolfini, and it was funny because the bartender did not really realize who he was waiting on, and finally, when he kept doing double takes, James Gandolfini said, it took you long enough to figure out who it was. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, Patty Bonanno, you're married to? My husband's name is Charlie. Charlie. He's a shell fisherman out of Clamour. Uh -huh. I mean, out of Chatham. Uh, and incredibly, he does he still have his rock band? He's, his other claim to fame is he is in a Van Halen tribute band. Oh. And he's the lead singer. Okay. He dresses up and plays David Lee Rock. And he's quite good at it. Very good. Oh, I'll have to go see it. So he still appears in various venues around he does. Uh, the Northeast? He does. He just played Plymouth Memorial Hall this past weekend, actually. Uh huh. Which was a pretty big success. Um, but uh, he's been doing that for 25 years. It's still going strong. Wow. How long have you been married? You and Charlie have been married? We, were, we got married in 1998, so it hasn't been all that long. Are there any difficulties being married to a rock star? <laughs> no, not really. I know, it's wonderful. I like Charlie. It's great to see you together. But we are another uh, successful Lanto romance. We met at the Lanto, yeah. which has happened to so many people here. So we have uh, happy stories and then some that didn't work out so well. Yeah, there's been divorces here, I guess. And, uh, uh, but yeah, a lot of people have met here and then gone on to marry. Yes. How much longer uh, do you plan to be here at the, at the hoe? At the hoe, I keep saying, okay, 25 years and then it's 26 years and so. Maybe I'll round it out to 30. <laughs> we could shoot for 30. <laughs> but you have, it's work, but I mean, it's fun to come here too. All your friends that you work with, yes. and all the regular customers. And yes. stuff. That's nice. It's like a home away from home, let's put it that way. Yeah. As long as you don't abuse it. <laughs> yes. And I know you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Patty. That okay. Was great. All right. Thank you very much.